Okay, and we're recorded. And you guys can see my screens. You can hear me. Type yes in the thing if you can. Awesome. Perfect. Okay. So um, I think they have the uh, slotted out for 9 to 1030. I don't think we'll go all the way to 1030, um, but we will see. Um, so also another thing to let you guys know, uh, this is not my PowerPoint. Uh, so if you see anything incorrect, anything that seems inaccurate to you, call me out on it and then I'll find out who made it. Uh, so we're going to go through when you're going to give blood products and how you can prescribe and administer those blood products. Um, let me go to my slides here. Uh oh, there we go. Uh, so just a little introduction and background uh, to giving blood. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, progress in terms of looking at circulation over the past few hundred years. Um, in the 1600s, William Harvey uh, showed how circulatory system functioned. And then after that, scientists became interested in transfusions, uh, initially transfusing animal blood into humans. Sounds kind of gross. Uh, first human to human transfusions were done in England in 1818 by Dr. James Blundell in postpartum hemorrhage patients. And then rapid steps have been made in understanding blood typing, blood components, and the storage of blood since early 1900s. And it's developed into the field of transfusion medicine, which is pretty commonplace nowadays. Um, transfusion of red blood cells has become a common procedure. In the US, around 15 million units are transfused annually and about 85 million worldwide. Uh, blood is typically stored in components, so typical ones that you'll see are packed red blood cells, plasma, which you'll also hear FFP, which stands for fresh frozen plasma, and platelets are usually your three that you typically see given. Um, every once in a while, you will also see cryoprecipitate as well. Um, we'll get into that a little later. Uh, hemoglobin in red blood cells binds oxygen and is the main source of oxygen delivery, and a single unit is a roughly about 350 milliliters, uh, so pine blood, and it contains about 250 milligrams of iron. So hemoglobin values um, vary by gender and race, and normal value for hemoglobin and hematocrit vary slightly by labs. Um, anemia is usually defined as hemoglobin less than 13 in males and less than 12 in females. Uh, current guidelines for transfusion of red blood cells um, kind of have a more restrictive threshold. Uh, generally speaking, seven is a usual one for asymptomatic healthy patients. So if you see a hemoglobin less than seven, we're going to think, hey, maybe we need to do a transfusion. Also, we need to figure out why is it that low, okay? Uh, multiple studies have shown it's acceptable threshold in other patient populations as well. Um, including those with GI bleeds and critically ill patients. So a lot of our patients that we see that are receiving blood, obvious sources of bleeding, um, but also there may be people that low that maybe there's something else going on too. Um, recommendation of hemoglobin of eight is a threshold in patients with certain things such as coronary artery disease or those undergoing orthopedic surgeries. Uh, and this may be secondary to lack of literature on using a threshold of seven. Um, just because if it's kind of the set way and doing a study that may potentially harm patients, then it's kind of delayed. People don't really want to study things that may potentially harm patients. So they're usually going to just give it an eight instead of seven for those type of patients. Um, the guidelines and clinical trials also recommend value of seven as the threshold for patients who are critically ill. Uh, transfusion may be indicated in patients with active or acute bleeding, as well as patients with symptoms of anemia. So if they have vital signs reflect, maybe they have tachycardic, they're having some weakness, shortness of breath with exertion. Um, so if they're symptomatic, hemoglobin less than eight, or if they're asymptomatic, hemoglobin less than seven, okay? Um, unless the patient's actively bleeding, it's recommended to transfuse one unit at a time, and then usually they will repeat an H&H &H within a couple hours after blood has been given. Um, usually when you're giving one unit of packed cells, the hemoglobin value will increase by one gram. So typically speaking, hey, if they have a hemoglobin of 6.8, I expect it to be somewhere around 7.8 when I do my recheck. Uh, and then the hem hemocrit 
by 3%. Um, and once again, you're just going to follow up by checking a couple hours after you've transfused. You'll recheck your lab, see where they reflect after the transfusion. Contraindications. There's no absolute contraindications, but uh, if the patient is over 18 years of age, they may refuse to receive transfusions. Um, specifically, we're thinking more of our religious grounds should be honored. Um, so when we think of religion, the one that I typically think of, Jehovah's Witness. Uh, so sometimes it's good, especially upon admission, when uh, they do an admission, sometimes we ask, do they have any religious uh, affiliations that they want us to uphold? That's a good time to figure that out now, you know. And also for anyone that's going to potentially get a surgery too, to know whether or not they're Jehovah's Witness, because you may have to do some of the um, blood saving type of techniques. Okay. So equipment. Blood products are transfused through IV tubing with filters. Uh, they're typically 170 to 260 microns uh, to prevent uh, debris from being administered as well. Trap materials can promote the bacterial growth. So we recommend that you don't use the tubing for more than four hours, which typically they say you should transfuse a unit of blood within the four hours. Um, it will vary from facility to facility. Most facilities, they'll just give you new tubing for each product. Um, but typically speaking, they'll usually say if you're rapid infusing, you can do two, two different products. And when I say two different products, I mean like two different units of blood on the same tubing and then switch out the tubing. Um, prior to transfusion, you should uh, saline prime all your tubing as well. Uh, blood products should be verified by two healthcare providers prior to administering, and patients should be monitored during transfusion by qualified personnel. So in the setting of our hospital, and usually typically in the U.S., um, I don't know in other countries how they do it, but we typically have two nurses will sign off on the blood administration section. Uh, they'll usually get a set of vitals before they start the blood, 15 minutes into the blood transfusion and then hourly after that 15 minutes until the blood's completed. And then they will take a, a set of vital signs after it has been completed. Uh, in terms of preparation, so um, we have a patient, we decide they want some blood or we need to give them some blood. Um, so we have to figure out what type of blood they can receive. Uh, so. We will do some pre-transfusion testing that we typically call a type and screen um, to check their compatibility between the recipient antibodies and the donor red blood cells. Uh, so like I said, we'll take some of their blood to send for the type and screen and it will verify what their blood type is and determine if they have any unexpected antibodies that might cause a reaction. Um, so when they say non-ABO1, so the two big ones that we look at is their ABO, and then we also look at the rhesus, so like the positive or negative. Um, another thing, so if they have some of the special outside of those type of antibodies, that you'll typically see patients that have received maybe massive blood transfusions in the past or very frequent blood transfusions are usually the ones that are going to have some other anti antibodies beyond your typical ABO and like the rhesus type stuff, okay? So those ones usually take a little bit longer to actually cross-check and make sure that we can find a unit that's acceptable for them. So it usually takes them a little bit longer to get blood too. Uh, in terms of preparation, uh, there's multiple methods for running uh, the screen. If the screen's negative, it's unlikely there will be any reaction to the blood. Uh, obtaining the blood for the patient will be basically rapidly if it's required. There are specifications, which we'll get into later when you're ordering for blood that um, you can actually state if it's needed as soon as possible um, or if it's meant to be on hold for a surgery or so forth. Uh, if the screen is positive, many blood banks will then cross match and hold two units of blood for a patient in case they need a transfusion. Um, so basically saying, hey, if they're a person that might have some antibodies and we need to find a like, special type of blood for them, we might have some on backup for them because we know it's going to take longer to find those type of units for this specific patient since we have to do multiple testing for them. Okay. Any questions so far? Just if you have a question, write it in the comment section and I'll see it and try to answer to the best of my ability. 
Uh, so some complications. Uh, we have different uh, complications that can arise when we're giving blood products to patients. Um, there can be multiple complications, including infections, hemolytic reactions, allergic reactions, uh, traily, so we get into lung injury, and um, circulatory overload, so maybe they get into a little bit of fluid overload, and electrolyte imbalances. Uh, according to AABB, febrile reactions are the most common, uh, followed by uh, transfusion circulatory overload. So maybe we get a little bit too much fluid overload. We're giving them blood too quickly. Maybe they have history of renal or CHF kind of in implications. Uh, then allergic reaction, then traily, uh, then hepatitis C, hepatitis B, and then HIV, and then hemolytic, fatal hemolytic uh, reactions, which is extremely rare. Uh, which only occurs in about one in two million transfused units of red blood cells. Um, so as you can see from their guidelines, this is the frequency that you see these different reactions. So obviously febrile action is much more common than the hemolysis. Um, now that they do screening and they, they have a much more advanced screening process when they actually have people donate blood, um, our rates in terms of the hepatitis and the HIV are much, much lower as well. So febrile reactions, these are the most common um, adverse event that we see, and typically you'll hear people uh, refer to it as a suspected transfusion reaction. Uh, so typically when we're transfusing with leukocyte reduced blood products, uh, most blood products in the US are already leukocyte reduced. It will help reduce febrile reactions. Um, and then if it does occur, transfusion should be halted you should evaluate the patient um, because sometimes a hemolytic reaction can initially appear as this febrile reaction. Um, so may have to determine whether or not, hey, maybe they're having hemolysis or maybe they're having an infectious reaction. Uh, treatment, uh, you have Tylenol, and then if needed, you can give antihistamines, so Benadryl for symptom control for like fever and like if they're having uh, any like itching, um, any hives, so forth. Well, that's more of your allergic one. Um, and then after treatment and exclusion of other causes, the transfusion can be resumed at a slower rate. So if they determine, hey, we don't think this is hemolytic, we don't think this is anything else, then usually you get the okay. Well, from the nursing's pers perspective, I would get the okay from the physician, mm -hmm. but you guys being the future physicians would probably say, hey, this looks like it's a febrile reaction. We can go ahead and start it. We're just gonna run it at a slow rate. And then if it seems like we're having any further issues, contact me again, stop the blood kind of deal. Uh, transfusion associated circulatory overload uh, is characterized by respiratory distress secondary to cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So this is someone that they're getting fluid overloaded. Um, it's most common in patients who already have fluid overloaded states. Like I said before, people that have renal issues or congestive heart failure issues. So keep in mind their background when you are getting ready to give blood as well. Uh, diagnosis is based on symptom onset within six to 12 hours of receiving a transfusion. Uh, so this can happen hours after you actually get that blood in. Um, clinical evidence of fluid overload, pulmonary edema. So, you know, maybe they have that um, kind of the frothy sputum cough up, uh, frothy pink sputum with pulmonary edema. Maybe if you listen to their lung sounds, they have crackles. Um, usually starting in the lower bases. Uh, and then you have an elevated BNP, uh, which kind of looks at the stretch of the heart and response to diuretics. Uh, preventative efforts as well as treatment include limiting the number of transfusions. Uh, so say, hey, maybe their hemoglobin is low, but we're only gonna give one to get them just a little bit in the middle ground because they're also a person that we have to be very conscientious about how much is going into them. Transfusing at slower rates, so we're not pounding them, you know, um, we can run it as slow as 60 milliliters per hour, but sometimes in certain cases, we will be bolusing blood in if they're hemorrhaging out. But for this case, we may need to think, hey, we need to be a little bit slower side. And then also administering diuretics before or between transfusions. Um, so I have seen this quite uh, in my own experience. Uh, we have a lot like with our open heart patients before where if they wanted to do multiple units, they'll say, give one unit, give 20 of Lasix. Um, and then we'll give another unit after kind of thing. Uh, 
uh, allergic reactions. So allergic reaction, um, this is the one that I was talking about, the hives and the itching earlier. It's more of the allergic reaction, not the febrile reaction, um, will occur in less than 1% of transfusions. Um, some severe uh, symptoms, which are less common that you might see are bronchospasm, wheezing, and anaphylaxis. It's very rare though. Uh, allergic reactions can be seen in patients who have immunoglobin A deficient uh, as exposure to the donor's immunoglobin A uh, can cause severe anaphylactoid reaction. So that's more dangerous for getting into your airway and airway protection. Um, and then it can be avoided by washing the plasma from the cells prior to transfusion, which we don't do. That's all blood bank shop. So uh, mild symptoms such as uh, itching and hives can be treated with antihistamines. So we're thinking of Benadryl once again. And then more severe symptoms uh, can be treated with bronchodilators. So if they're having those bronchospasms, we need to start thinking about that, think about steroids, and then potentially epi. Um, so sometimes the bronchospasms still even do racemic epi and stuff like that. Truly. Uh, so we have transfusion-related lung injury, often referred to as truly, is uncommon, um, occurs in about 1 out of 12,000 transfusions. Patient will develop symptoms with two to four hours after receiving the transfusion. So just be aware, we give some of these patients blood, but we still, after the blood is done, aren't in the clear. There are certain things that we need to keep an eye out for over that next 12 hours or so, because there's certain different things that have onsets that are a little bit delayed. Um, so these ones, two to four hours after receiving the transfusion, patient will develop acute hypoxic respiratory distress, uh, similar to ARDS picture. Uh, the patient will have pulmonary edema without evidence of left heart failure. So they've checked their central venous pressure. They have a normal pressure of like two to six. Um, but they're showing, once again, pulmonary edema. Looking at the patient, a pretty typical sign is they start having frothy pink sputum that they're coughing at. Or if you take a listen, maybe they have some crackles. Uh, diagnosis will be based on the recent history of receiving the transfusion. Uh, the chest x-ray will have diffuse patchy infiltrates uh, with the exclusion of any other etiologies. Um, and then, uh, oh, well, there's a 10% mortality, remaining 90% will resolve within 96 hours with supportive care. Um, so we just make sure that we keep an eye on them. We treat the pulmonary edema and so forth, and then go for it. Okay. Infections. Uh, these are potential complication, although it's decreased, uh, like I said before, because they started being stricter on screening potential donors, so that Hep C and HIV are much less risk. Uh, and then bacterial infection can also occur, but does so rarely, once in about every 250 units of red cells transfused. Once again, in terms of the bacterial, we can be part of that effort to re uh, reduce those, once again, by changing out the blood tubing. Um, between products or not using more than two products per line. Uh, when I say products, I mean units. And also uh, making sure that we're infusing within four hours. Hold on, I gotta, I gotta take a drink break. Okay. Okay, fatal hemolysis, not good. This is extremely rare, occurring about one of nearly two million transfusions. It's a result of ABO incompatibility. So recipients' antibodies recognize and induce hemolysis in the donor's transfused cells. A patient will develop acute onset fever and chills. So once again, that's why you have to be careful with the febrile reactions, making sure that it's not just a kind of a sign of what's to come with a hemolytic reaction. Uh, they'll also have low back pain, flushing, um, dyspnea, as well as becoming tachycardic and going into shock. Uh, so treatment, if you recognize this, you're going to stop the transfusion right away. You're going to leave IV in the place and place intravenous fluids. So you're just going to put normal saline on different tubing connected to that IV. Um, and then you're going to try to monitor their urine output and make sure that it's greater than 100 milliliters an hour. And diuretic, diuretics may also be needed uh, and cardiorespiratory support as appropriate these type of patients. Um, so typically speaking, and I think we'll get into this later in the lecture in terms of transfusion reactions, uh, when this happens, like we said, stop the blood product, 
put a normal saline on, with different tubing onto that IV. You're going to keep the unit that you have because usually when we do transfusion reactions, we'll want to send the blood product that we stopped along with a urine specimen down to the lab. But each hospital will have its own protocol on how to do that, but that's a pretty common procedure for these type of reactions, okay? Uh, so workup should be performed, oh, like I just said, uh, sending the donor blood and tubing um, and then post-transfusion labs. So this is the ones they have here. So it looks like they're going to do another type and screen. So they'll need some more blood from the patient. They'll do direct and indirect Coombs tests, which I think that just looks at um, reactions to antibodies. I think the direct looks straight at their red blood cells and indirect looks at their plasma interactions with the blood. Uh, get a CBC, creatinine, uh, prothrombin times, uh, PTT, draw from the other arm so it's not on the same arm that they were receiving blood, um, haptoglobin, indirectability, LDH, plasma-free hemoglobin, and a UA for hemoglobin. So typically they'll start seeing some of that hemoglobin if the it's breaking down in the blood then the kidneys will excrete and it'll show up in the urine. Electrolyte abnormalities. Uh, these can also occur, they're pretty rare. It's usually when you see more of like massive blood transfusions. Um, hypocalcemia uh, can result as citrate, which is an anticoagulant in the blood products, binds with calcium. Uh, hyperkalemia can occur from release of potassium from cells during storage. So maybe some of those cells open up tear, shear, whatever, um, any of that potassium that was intracellular will go then into the blood product. Um, so high risk in neonate, neonates and patients with renal insufficiency. Hypokalemia can also result uh, because of alkal alkalinization, I can't say that word, of the blood as citrate is converted to bicarb by the liver in patients with normal hepatic function. So just some of the labs to be aware of that you will have to uh, keep an eye on, especially when you're looking at patients that are receiving massive blood transfusion. So maybe someone that might be in DIC, someone that is a trauma patient are pretty good examples of that. So clinical significance, as mentioned in the introduction, science of transfusion medicine, including red blood cells has evolved over the past century, um, as has medicine. Uh, so obviously we have multiple different specialties now. Uh, the ability to transfuse red cells into patients safely and rapidly has uh, definitely helped trauma, surgical, and GI bleed among other conditions. And it's going to continue to evolve uh, as science is continuing to improve the process and also looking at alternative methods to carry oxygen to cells, which could potentially reduce the risk of reactions that we have and infections as well as potentially ease storage because you have to be very particular in how they store it so it is proper, properly contained. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, yes, yeah, so our understanding of blood transfusions has dramatically increased over the past three decades. Uh, we typically are no longer just giving blood just because we want to. We really need to evaluate whether or not the patient needs it if they'll benefit from it because it does have its own risks. Uh, and then healthcare workers who look after patients needing blood transfusion um, should consult with hematologists if they're unsure about the indications. Uh, so the goal is to make sure that these products that we're giving will be having benefits to the patient because they do come with a risk as well. Um, in terms of hematologists, for pulling from examples in the past week, we had a patient in the ICU that her platelets were consistently low. And I don't know, he or she, sorry. Uh, platelets were consistently low. Um, they had been giving platelet transfusions for a certain, below a certain level for platelets. And they talked to the hematologist, and the hematologist was suspecting that they might have ITP and said, let's not give these products because um, they're just going to eat their body's gonna eat up this platelets for basically hasten, like harming them by putting more into them. So if you ever have any concerns, just remember hematologists know their stuff. Okay, this is the first part of it. 
Um, this is now going to shift its focus more to the practical uh, implications of how we go through the process of ordering the blood, um, how it, we get at the blood, and how we give the blood. Okay. Any questions up to this point? Once again, type them if you have them. So prior to your transfusion, uh, every patient who's having blood uh, for a transfusion must be wearing their correct wristband. Obviously, we're very strict about making sure it's the right patient um, and the right treatment. Uh, so they have their ID band on that will have both their name and their date of birth. So you can do two identifying factors for them. Um, they should have this band on. They shouldn't ask why they have the band on. Everyone knows they get a, a wristband. So the other thing too is receiving blood is a consentable uh, treatment. So if you have a patient that you want to give blood to, they'll need to discuss why the patient needs blood, what some of the risks are, the benefits, and have them consent, and they do have to sign a blood consent. If they refuse the blood, especially if you're talking about more like Jehovah's Witness, that they just do not want blood, there is a section particularly on our consent on the back side that says that the patient is signing to say that they do refuse blood. Uh, so like I said, informed consent. Uh, there are exceptions. If we have a patient that is unable to consent and it's a medical emergency, we can override and say that it is a medical emergency and that they need these. Uh, then they will collect the type and screen. So typically they'll put in the order. If they have a line, they'll have a nurse draw it. If not, phlebotomist will come by and draw to do the type and screen. Um, let's see here. So once again, if you, it's not within your scope of practice to do this, find out whose it is and make them do it. So yes, the phlebotomist will come and collect the blood for that procedure. Um, let's see, units of blood and blood products must be collected immediately prior to the transfusion taking place. Transfusion of blood and blood products must be commenced within 30 minutes of arrival in the clinical area. So basically what they're saying is they have special fridges that they store these different types of blood products. Um, they store these deck in the blood bank at a certain temperature. So when they send them to us, we have a certain amount of time to hang them. I believe ours might be 20 here, but this one, it's typically around 20 to 30 minutes that once you've received the product that you have time to confirm it, hang it, and give it. Um, well, start it. Um, if you have something that happens, maybe you go to do your... Uh, pre-transfusion vital signs, maybe the patient already has a fever. Um, so you're generally not going to want to give it because you won't be able to tell whether they're having a febrile reaction to it. Um, you might say, hey, I call the blood bank. I have to bring these back, this unit back down um, and I have to get their fever down before I start the blood. So you're going to check the details on the blood collection form that match the details on the patient's wristband. Uh, you're going to have a blood collection form uh, that has the patient's identification and take it to the blood bank um, to receive your blood product. Uh, if you're the person going down to collect the blood, you're going to check the patient's identity, look at their name, their hospital number, date of birth, and then also look at the blood collection form against the unit of blood and blood products. Um, and then usually blood bank will do the bottom portion here where um, they'll document the removal of the unit in the blood fridge. That's all on the lab and blood bank to do that paperwork. Uh, so then once again, you're not going to take any detours. You're not going to go eat lunch. You're going to go directly back to the unit with your blood and try to get that process started of getting the blood hung and ready to go. Uh, so if you're transporting different products that are stored at different temperatures, just be cautious. Also, and actually receiving certain products, some have to be thawed or prepared a certain way. So platelets and FFP may take them like 20 to 30 minutes to thaw out. So just be aware of your time frames on that too. Uh, so you'll all look at your, whatever hospital you end up doing with your future career, kind of look at their policies and procedures in terms of how they store and transport the blood, how people receive the blood. Here, for example, um, we usually can send a slip down and they'll tube the blood up to us, uh, but 
if they're tubing blood up to us, we do need to make someone aware or keep on our ears out for the tube station because once again, you have that 20 to 30 minute time frame to hang the blood. You don't want that blood be sitting past 30 minutes in the tube station. Um, if you collect the blood or blood product at the request of another health professional, um, you need to tell them once again, it's here. We've got to hang it sooner than later. Um, let's see. So if, like I said before, we can't get the blood within the 30 minutes, um, we're going to check to see how to return the blood in the circumstances. Sometimes if it's been out of temperature control for more than 30 minutes, a uh, blood bank may say that you have to waste it. Ideally, 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 never waste blood. We have a national shortage right now. Blood is very valuable. We don't want to waste it if we can avoid it. Um, so make sure that once you have that product, that is your priority to get that blood up and ready and hung. Okay. Prior to administering the blood, uh, once again, make sure it's within your scope of practice for you guys, depending on what country you work in, you may have the responsibility of hanging it. Um, like I said, here, we typically have two nurses that will sign off and hang it. Uh, make sure that the patient is easily observable so that you can observe those first 15 minutes when the blood transfusion is started so that you can see any possible reactions that are occurring right away. You'll gather all of your necessary equipment. Make sure that they have a good IV in place. Um, Typically, at least at our hospital, when we receive a, a unit or a product, a blood product, um, they'll give us the tubing and a saline bag as well to already have to prepare. Um, let's see, when small volume transfusions are being drawn into a syringe for neonatal or pediatric patients, appropriate filter is used and the blood pack is left attached to the syringe or giving set. Um, we typically, in terms of our infusion pumps, uh, the Laris pumps that we currently have for all of our IVs and drugs uh, can be used to put whole blood through. And then a lot of times, like your FFP and your platelets can just be gravity flow. So they'll sometimes give you tubing that's free flow um, that doesn't actually go into the pump itself. Once again, make sure that you have a good IV access, that it's open and pain. Uh, the blood, oh, so in terms of blood warmers, so... If you need to get a blood warmer, maybe you're doing a massive blood transfusion, you don't want to dip the patient's uh, temperature down too low because these come up fairly cool. Uh, you may need to use an approved blood warmer and make sure that you're trained in using that type of blood warmer. Uh, so typically, you won't see blood warmers in most all inpatient areas. You usually only see it like in the ED, sometimes in the ICU, and sometimes in the OR uh, is where you'll typically see those type of uh, things. So when you are giving blood, try to have your own dedicated IV. Don't try to be giving other drugs or drips through the same IV at the same time. Uh, we just want to make sure there's no interactions whatsoever. Uh, explain the procedure of the blood administration to the patient. Confirm that they understand why they're receiving that transfusion and ask if they have any questions about it. Uh, you're going to take, once again, that baseline pre-transfusion vital signs and then record those um, in the chart. Then you're going to go through the process of scanning. So you'll scan the patient, you'll scan the product, which I think in the skills day we had shown you like that blood where it has a cup, like one, two, three, four, like four or five different barcodes on it that you scan the product, the type of product it is, so forth, and the expiration date on it. Um, you're going to look at the unit itself, make sure that there's no damage to the bag, that there's no like clots or anything inside the bag with the blood. Um, any other things that look abnormal for the bag, and then make sure that the expiration date is not past the expiration. Um, if it's for that day, typically speaking, it'll be at uh, midnight for the expiration. You're going to check the prescription for the blood or blood products has completed correctly, um, and then you're going to go ahead and get ready to scan and administer your product. Once again, do this as clean as possible. Wash your hands, put on gloves. It is blood, so universal precautions. Um, and then any other issues they have. Okay.
So you're going to take the unit of blood to the patient. You're going to look at the unit. You're going to look in the computer against the unit on the actual bag itself. You're going to look at the patient's ID versus the patient ID on the unit itself. Uh, you're going to have the second person uh, verify with you. So usually one person will be looking at the computer. One person will be looking at the blood unit. One person will then go over and look at the patient's ID band and ask the patient if they are able to tell you their full name and date of birth. If they're unable, um, your other member, like I said, can go and look at their patient's identity on their wristband. Um, make sure that you do this all just to make sure you have correct patients, you have the correct blood, you have everything that is correct. If you run into any problems, um, so maybe you scan one barcode and it says this is not the correct unit. Uh, you'll have to make sure that the, you're scanning the right barcode. Um, if you go into too many hangups, contact the blood bank and say, we're having a problem. It's saying it's not the correct unit of blood. I just want to make sure this is the correct one for this patient. Okay, and then once you've scanned through all the different scans, double checks, triple checks, uh, you will co-sign to say that you guys are starting the blood at this rate. Their pre-transfusion vitals are looking okay, um, and go from there. Uh, most people kind of gloss through this, but just make sure it is a very vital vital thing because if you are giving the wrong blood to the wrong patient, there can be very big implications for that. Once again, be super clean, wash your hands, make sure that you're not the one causing the infection. Uh, then you'll start the transfusion, setting the rate, making sure that the blood is received within four hours of getting it from storage. Uh, and typically speaking, in terms of platelets and fresh frozen plasma, as I had said before, are free flow in. So they're usually transfused within about 30 minutes. Um, can be even faster than that since it's free flow. Uh, you're going to tell the patient to let you know or anybody else know if they've begun to feel flushed, at, at, have any shivering, shortness of breath, any new pain or other symptoms um, once the transfusion has commenced. Uh, and then just be cautious because obviously your unconscious patients um, or younger patients, if you have pediatric patients, uh, may not be able to report these symptoms to you. So you'll have to kind of see the signs of if there's any potential reactions. You're gonna take their vital signs, uh, like I said, typically before 15 minutes into the transfusion and then hourly thereafter, and then upon a completion of the uh, unit as well. Uh, once again, you're going to check the patient very frequently, especially in those first 15. You really should be within eye shot, ear shot, and or just in the room with that patient. Uh, record your observations. Usually, we'll do start the blood out a little bit slower in those first 15, and then if they seem to be tolerating okay, you can go up to a higher rate. If they so show any signs of adverse reactions, um, any chill, pain or oozing at the IV site, uh, burning along the vein, chest pain, flank pain, bronchial spasms or respiratory distress, pretty much anything out of here, you're going to stop the blood. Uh, you'll stop it right away. Um, you'll call for assistance immediately. And like I said, you'll switch out, you'll disconnect that blood, and then put saline through that line with a different tubing. Okay. And then measure your output if possible. All reactions must be recorded in the patient's record um, through hospital incident report. So it'll be considered, we have like a reporting system. So it's like an, an incident, they'll have to put in the RL6 here. Um, another thing under the charting itself there in the blood section, there'll be a suspected transfusion reaction, which you'll click on that if you suspect the transfusion reaction. And then you'll have to chart what signs or symptoms they're showing that can indicate possible reaction. So once you've completed each unit of blood or blood products, you're going to, like I said, take their vital signs after it's been completed, um, just making sure that everything looks okay, they're still doing okay and tolerating. You're going to disconnect them from the blood product and the tubing, and you can dispose of it. Um, typically, we just throw them in the biohazard uh, bags in the room. And then you can complete the fluid balance and other charts. So you're going to put in for your INOs in the computer, which once again, this will be typically be a nurse here at this hospital. Um, depending on what country you decide to practice in, it may vary as to whether it is a physician or a nursing um, duty. 
uh, and then you'll record how much intake they've had. Uh, you'll include your unit and then any of the saline that you used uh, to prime before and after to flush the blood product in um, and then put that in the records along with the post vital signs. Any questions regarding this PowerPoint? I have another one to show you guys too. Let me exit out of here. Okay, give me one second to try to bring the other one over here. Oh, it's right here. I'm just gonna bring this over. Can you guys see this one? Okay, so this is more pertinent to our, our specific computer system in terms of the workflow for the blood transfusion. So just a kind of a summary to go through kind of what we had just discussed a little bit. So transfusion workflow starts with the physician is gonna place the order. Um, so for our specific computer system, they have where they're gonna put in a type and screen so that we can determine the patient's blood type. Uh, they're gonna do a prepare, so say we're giving uh, platelets, we'll say prepare one unit of platelets so, and transfuse one unit of platelets. These are two separate orders, one for the blood bank to prepare it and then the other one so that we know that we can actually get it from the blood bank and give that blood. Uh, so blood bank will do their tests, make sure that we have the correct products. Um, once they do that, we have a, a part in the computer that will say that we can release the blood product from the nursing side. So they'll click on that and it'll, generate a form that we can tube down to the lab and then they'll send up the product. Um, so once they release it, we will start the transfusion as we had kind of discussed in the other PowerPoint, how we go through the double, triple checks on that. And then we perform it and document it in Epic. So on the care unit, like I said, the two nurses will verify, sorry, water break. They'll get the initial vital signs and then um, additional vital signs will be done 15 minutes into the transfusion and then hourly until we've stopped. And then we'll have another set of vital signs completing the transfusion. Um, so this stuff in terms of releasing it, this goes through more of the epic stuff. Um, I don't care about this as much because it's more of a dated one. I don't really care about these. Um, so on the uh, blood transfusion itself will have where it'll say release on this side and then we'll say uh, give the blood transfusion so we can get into the screen and actually start them. The main things that I wanted out of that was kind of the flow process, which your guys' PowerPoint covered pretty well. Um, the one thing, this PowerPoint's a little bit different than the one that I had last year from your school um, that I kind of wanted to get into that wasn't really covered as much in your guys' PowerPoint was the different products themselves. Um, so... We have, as we had said, red blood cells, packed red blood cells, which those ones typically, if they're bleeding, if their hemoglobin is low, um, once again, we talked about the cutoffs in terms of the hemoglobin levels of seven or hemoglobin of eight with symptomatic reasons. Um, I have seen exceptions to that with certain surgical type patients like our cabbage patients. Um, so packed cells, mostly for hemoglobin levels and active bleeding. Um, FFP, so fresh frozen plasma, we get into typically if we see someone that's oozing and we check their INR level and it's elevated, uh, can quickly correct. So maybe they were on Coumadin, uh, they weren't checking their INR, you know, on the recommended levels and they come in with a uh, super therapeutic INR of like 12, uh, we can give them some FFP to kind of correct that. Um, when we get into platelets, obviously platelets, if they're oozing a lot too and their platelets are low, that can help in terms of clotting. Um, just to be aware though, I would say in terms of my blood transfusions, I've seen reactions mostly with platelets is the most common. So if you're giving platelets, just be aware, you might want to be more cautious in evaluating those type of patients and keeping a closer eye on them for those type of reactions, okay? And then cryo, cryoprecipitate, usually you see that more with patients that are oozy and or getting like massive blood transfusion. Cryoprecipitate has more clotting factors in it. Um, so we got an oozy patient. They've been getting a lot of different types of blood products. We might throw cryo in there too. Um, in terms of massive blood transfusion, wherever you end up at your hospital will have its own protocol in terms of massive transfusions. 
Typically, you're signing over as an emergency release for these products. Sometimes, especially if you go to like a trauma hospital, they won't necessarily have time to even do the type and screen. So they'll go ahead and they'll just give them O negative. Uh, since O negative is a universal donor. Um, and then they, depending on, I think there's different recommendations from different professional societies in terms of like the amount of different types of blood products that you give, like two, two, and one in terms of the ratios for pack cells, FFP, and platelets. Um, but each hospital will have kind of their own setting based off those guidelines. Um, in terms of the returning blood, like I said, if there's something that's a hang up in terms of the, you might not be able to potentially start your blood within that 20 to 30 minutes, just keep that in the first, that's your first priority. As soon as you get that blood to try to get that hung, if you don't think that's gonna happen, you need to get on the phone with blood bank and try to get that blood unit back to them as soon as possible so that we make sure that, hey, they can store it again and then maybe something changes and we can give it to our patient later, but they'll be able to use that same unit. Um. I think that's pretty much it. Do you guys have any question about blood? Anything that we didn't quite cover that you're curious about? I guess it's a lot faster than uh, I thought it would be. We're, I think just under, we're about 50 minutes in. Um, I know we covered kind of how we do the tubing and all that stuff in skills day. Um, if you guys ever see someone scanning it, you might just pop your head and see kind of the process that they do. Um, otherwise, if you have any very thorough questions about blood, I would recommend you guys to pick uh, Dr. Silly and Dr. Imam's brains because they're very knowledgeable about hematology. <laughs> um, if you guys think of any questions, uh, feel free uh, to email myself or Linda. Um, and then otherwise, y'all have a good day, okay?